Hi, this is Howie Jacobson with the Checkmate Method webinar, How to Dominate Your Market with Game Over Advertising. Um, I am the author of Google AdWords for Dummies, three uh, different editions now, and the Checkmate work all came out of my familiarity with AdWords and seeking ways to understand markets better, to understand the, the people who are clicking better, because one thing AdWords does is it makes you very numbers oriented. And you start thinking in terms of numbers and not people. Um, if you've ever had a, you know, a brick and mortar store where people come in and you can see them face to face and talk to them, or even a phone business where there's real human beings, AdWords and online marketing can really distance yourself you, you, from the idea of other human beings. And so I was looking for a way to, uh, to really understand the competitive landscape, but more importantly, to understand that there are people and, and to really focus on what people want and what they click on and what they don't click on. And so that's where Checkmate came from. It's moved far beyond AdWords, um, but I still, it's still closely tied with it in my mind because of certain uh, structural advantages that AdWords provides. So I want to talk a little bit about the word dominate, which is in, the, in a lot of my marketing. Um, it was a word that, uh, you know, that I found very effective in, uh, in getting people interested when I say dominate your market. And in fact, that is what I'm promising, but I want to back away from the word dominate, which is kind of a military metaphor. Um, and there's so much of marketing is based on military metaphors, like, you know, uh, we're going to crush the competition, we're going to wage this battle in the media, we're going to have campaigns, and we're going to blitz the airwaves. And the problem with this is is not so much of an ethical problem, um, although I really don't like it, but uh, I don't want to impose my my morals on anyone else. But I think ultimately this kind of mindset makes us focus on the wrong thing, and we're we're now focusing on our competitors and how we can best them, as opposed to focusing on our prospects and how we can serve them. So rather than dominate, um, I would like to focus on connection. So let's give you a real example. So here is um, a couple of scenes from Gone with the Wind. Lady on the left is Scarlett O'Hara, the, uh, the most sought after bachelorette in the uh, antebellum south. There she is on the right with her big floppy hat at a party, a, a picnic at the Wilkes Plantation, and all the boys around her, all the young men, want her. And they're all trying to win her as you know, so they want to be her beau and her husband. And if you'll notice, they're all dressed the same. They all look the same. They have the same hairstyles. They have the same facial expressions. They say the same things. And she's utterly bored with all of them. All she gets there is a sea of sameness. Everyone's saying the same thing, the safe thing, the best practice thing, the obvious thing. But because there's, you know, a seven or eight of them there, she cannot decide. She can't distinguish and she's bored. No one is, saying, is making any effort to be unique or to get to know her as her. They're just playing the part of the eligible Southern Bachelor. And because of this, she ends up in the arms and the marital bed of probably the worst guy in the world for her, the, the abusive, cynical, rascally Rhett Butler. And so we all know how that turned out. Someone who just was different not even in a good way, managed to win her attention and for a short time her affection. Um, and you know, when, when your uh, most significant relationship in your life ends with the other person saying, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, that's probably a sign that something's gone wrong. So the big problem here is how to cut through the clutter of all that sameness, but at the same time, being relevant and appealing to your ideal customer. So, you know, one of these uh, southern gentlemen could have gotten the idea to look a little bit different. Maybe he would have appeared in, you know, lion skins with a club and unshaven. Or maybe he would have invented the mohawk and pierced his nose. Uh, both of those would have gotten him noticed, but probably not in a good way. Uh, it's easy to cut through the clutter in a negative way or a totally irrelevant way, but how do you cut through the clutter when your market is screaming, and, every, and, and, and the, you know, the idea of hype that we all know about from online sales letters and all that stuff, the idea of, of hype is that all the, all the channels have been taken, 
And so in order to be heard now, you have to sort of amp up and maybe louder than anyone else at the frequency that everyone's speaking. And of course, what that does is it makes everyone else have to amp up their frequency too. So when you see hype in a marketplace, that's a, a clear indication that everybody's saying the same thing and there's a, um, a positive feedback loop of louder and louder and louder. So that's the goal of Checkmate, to help you speak on a different wavelength at a different frequency that is actually more appealing more relevant, more attractive to your ideal customer than the same old, same old best practices that everyone else is talking about. So three concepts I want to go over here. First one is keywords are compressed desires. And the picture here is from Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. The crew of the Enterprise has returned to 20th century Earth to save the universe. And Scotty, the engineer has to interface with an, uh, the first um, generation Macintosh computer. And so he sits down, and as he's used to on the Enterprise, he says, computer, computer, but it doesn't respond. He gets more frustrated, says it louder. Computer, computer, nothing. Uh, Dr. McCoy suggests that he pick up the mouse. Maybe that's a microphone, and he tries that. And you can see there in the picture, he's hopeful. Then finally, the uh, 20th century Earthling says, just use the keyboard, and with a look of disdain, a crack of his fingers, and saying, how quaint, he starts typing onto the keyboard. And that is all of us when we are performing a Google search, because nobody wants to type in three or four words. If we have a problem, a need, a desire, we want to talk about it. So if I say, you know, I've, I've had these point-and-shoot cameras, and I started out with like a really cheap one, this uh, like you know $160 Kodak and it's just a you know, fixed lens and it was pretty good but then I started seeing posting stuff to Facebook and I noticed I had friends who were taking gorgeous pictures and I kind of wanted to know how they did it so I asked and they said well you know you use a, a digital SLR you get so much more and it's not even that much more expensive for some of them and so I really you know I bought one I uh, I, I read all the reviews and I got this one and I have no idea what to do with it. The, the manual, this silly little manual that came with is 70 pages long, but it's all about details of, of what to do, and there's nothing about, like, how do I actually take better pictures, and I just feel stupid. I did spend, you know, a little more than I should have on this. It was like $750, and so do you see what's going on? I'm like, you know, drunk at the bar, pouring my soul out, and Google is going, use the keyboard, give me three words. So I have to then go say, learn digital photography, learn to use Canon T2i. And that is a compression, a very severe compression of the complex and long and rambling um, way that I'm thinking about the problem. And so because keywords are compressed desires, it's our job to decompress them. And like anything where there's data loss, going backwards is not a sure thing, but using Checkmate we can we can do some pretty rich work. And it might be right and it might not be, but it will certainly be richer than if we hadn't tried it in the first place. And at this point, let me say that if anyone has questions, please type them in the question box, and I will get to them as soon as I get to the first uh, easy place to answer them. Second concept is your ideal customer. So this circle here, um, bordered in, uh, with the red ring, represents everyone searching for a particular keyword. So if they're searching for learn digital photography, that's everybody, the whole thing. Now, in the, in the very middle, there is a small green dot called perfect fit. So if you think about it, lots of reasons people could be typing in learn digital photography. It could be someone who wants to do it as a career. It could be uh, someone in their 20s who's you know, in college, just got out of college, and wants to be a photographer, and they're looking for a professional course. Um, could be someone else who has a business and they want to do their own uh, website work. So they're looking to, do, to take pictures for their own. It could be someone who just wants better pictures on Facebook, uh, to share pictures with friends, to make iMovie slideshows. So there's all sorts of different people typing that in. So for, for you, Ken, the, uh, it sounds like the, uh, the third group, the one who just wants to be a hobbyist and take better pictures, is the one you're after. Now, within that group, there's also different ways people want to learn. Someone wants a book. 
someone wants to take a live class and actually take their camera and go out and get instruction and have feedback right away. Someone else is happy with a digital course. Someone else would like a DVD. Someone else wants to be better at it but doesn't actually want to even try. <laughs> you know, they, they, they actually, when, when they come right down to it, they're not interested in actually applying themselves. So somewhere in there is your perfect fit way down in the middle. And it would be a mistake for you to try to advertise to everyone who typed in that keyword, because most of them are not your customer. Most of them would come to your website after charging you money for a click, and they wouldn't buy because it's not a right fit. So instead of going for everyone, trying to get the highest click-through rate you possibly can, I would encourage you to, to identify your perfect fit people and write ads that specifically try to attract your ideal customer, your perfect fit. And so the third concept is game over ads. And as I said, they attract the little, the little green dot in the middle, your ideal customer. And ideally, they repel everyone else, or at least become invisible to everyone else, so you don't get a lot of clicks from people who, sh who shouldn't buy from you, who won't buy from you, who shouldn't even be on your website. And the third thing it does is it prepares your ideal customer for your website. Because Checkmate is not just about the ad, it's going through the entire process. Tonight we're only talking about the ad, uh, but in the, in the uh, Virtual Camp Checkmate course, which starts on November 6th, and uh, which is the reason I'm doing these webinars, to, uh, to give you a taste so you'll sign up for more, um, we go over the entire sales funnel, not just the ad. So the interesting thing about game over ads is just mathematically speaking, if they're increasing the right click-through rate, that one in the, in the middle there, and they're decreasing the wrong click-through rate, the ones on the outside, the people who shouldn't be coming to your website, all of a sudden, your website is doing better. You're getting more conversions. For every 100 people who show up at your website, you're converting more of them because they're more of the right people. So you've improved your website without even touching your website. And that's one of the really nice features of Game Over Ads. So um, Checkmate itself works. Um, this part of it is a, a four-step process. Uh, that we're going to be doing with Ken. And I want to get everybody uh, to a place where you can contribute and help out. Um, in fact, as, as Ken, as I talk about this, I think I am going to go into uh, some of the issues of, of emotionality, even though it might seem uh, like it wouldn't be a good fit, but I want to try it anyway. So we're going to start with a keyword. So Ken, if you want to type for me the um, most common keyword or the, your, the best keyword that you would use or one that comes to mind, that people who are searching for what you've got uh, would type. Once we do that, then we go and look at digital photography course. Awesome. Then we go and we matrix the competition uh, using a tool that I created called the Checkmate Matrix, and we look at the search results page using it. Then we create an ideal customer avatar, and then we put the avatar next to the com competition, and we see what are the gaps. Where is the competition falling short? Where are they not speaking to our avatar? And very often, it, it becomes almost shocking to see the gap, to see what they're saying and what the avatar really needs to hear in order to move forward. So let us uh, bring Google in here and start with the keyword. And Ken, I'm going to unmute you again. All right, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. So we're going to type in digital photography course. Oops, course is no, just singular. So we can see uh, it's a it's a very uh, competitive keyword. There's a lot of different ads here. Uh, as I'm looking, I see one local ad that has a, a uh, an address in my town and directions. The rest look like they are national as opposed to local. So the online, yeah, online, online courses. So, so here's the, here, let's let's take a quick look at this page, and I'd like folks who are uh, who are not live, like Ken is, who can, but you can type. Just take a look at this page, and tell me what you see. What's, what is of interest here? If you were going to um, advise Ken, who wants to advertise on this site, 
what what would you tell him about his competition? What do you see right now? And Ken, feel free to to to, vo to voice things that you notice. Okay. Um. They all really seem very similar. Nothing is really standing out. Okay. So what what is uh, what are they? Who who are they um, trying to get? So uh, they all say they all say digital photography course. So there's a lot of that. Uh, Some of them are aim aimed at professionals. Because it's saying like earn a new earn money, new career. Wow. Yeah, this is this is a highly. Uh, if you if you if, let's let's look at them. So the first one here: study and earn a degree. Yeah. Um, become a successful photographer at your own pace. Get our a perspective at an institute that also is professional. Yes. Um, you know, as um, Don says, lots of EDUs. <laughs> so you know, if you want an institution, you you're all you're all set. Oh, there's another uh, local. How about this one? Pro photography degrees, also going for the professional. Yep. Online photography course, earn money, start a new career. How about ten months of hands-on training professionals? Do you think that's uh, for professionals? I'd say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Raleigh Photo School, uh, Raleigh Art School. It's hard to tell. That could go either way. Yeah. Um, digital camera photographs. So buy from Canon. So there's there's a nice irrelevant ad. <laughs> uh, some, somebody at Canon is not using uh, keywords properly. So if anyone here knows someone at Canon uh, in the marketing department, have them give me a call. <laughs> um, and then these three are basically uh, well, where digital art and design degree, accredited online university. Uh, let's, let's not even go there. So yeah, you can full see basically. Sorry, I was going to say full sale. They do quite expensive courses on various design things. Right. So, so Google basically thinks that, uh, at least the advertisers think that digital photography course means people who want to make a living at this and are willing to spend big bucks and spend a lot of time. So you can, if, if that's not your market, you immediately have a very easy way to distinguish yourself in this market. Uh, so Ross here has, you know, they're all focused on photography. Could you focus on results? So it's immediately something that comes to mind to Ross is no one's saying you can take take better pictures. Right? Does anything here say take great pictures? You know, get, uh, catch, catch the sunset. Um, right? It's it's a brick. Turn it into a camera. <laughs> Right, so we're so without even without even doing a matrix or anything, just by looking carefully at, at who the market is, we already see there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, Ross also said, "What about the feeling that the student wants to have after they know how to take photos? You know, a feeling of competence um, as opposed to sort of a silliness. I had the same feeling about my Martin guitar, which I bought in 1993." And always wanted to be good enough to play on a Martin guitar. Like I figured, well, I buy it, I'll take lessons, I'll practice. And to this day, I feel like, well, I play a much better guitar than I am a guitarist. And there's a little bit of, of, of uh, you know, sort of silliness, a, a very light smattering of shame around that. And someone with, you know, with a professional camera, someone who's, you know, maybe get the prosumer or the was it the seven D or some amazing Canon camera or a top-of-the-line Nikon um, and they can't take good pictures with it might have that same sort of sheepish feeling a little embarrassed yeah a little embarrassed a little sheepish so the feeling that the student wants to have after they know how to take photos it could you know that could be one of them like I don't want to feel sheepish I want to feel competent I want to feel like I'm in sync that I haven't wasted my money that it was a it was a good choice that I'm using it and I'm and I'm competent at it and I actually get better pictures. So this is all um, just based on a quick look at the uh, at the search engine results page. I feel like I want to skip over the matrix. Um, so so let's go back to the presentation for a bit. You start with a keyword, 
then you look at the uh, search results page. And then here's the matrix. And I think I want to skip over it because it doesn't feel all that necessary now. We already see a huge, right in this in the offer field, the offer is for everybody, become a professional photographer. So we immediately have, without even going into features, benefits, call to action, all that other stuff, we immediately have our, our area of strategic differentiation. And it wouldn't be very hard, even if we stopped the call right now, for you to write some ads that strategically differentiated you from everyone else on this page. And all those people who want to be professional photographers would totally ignore your ad, mm -hmm. as they should. And only the amateurs uh, who are really interested in what you give them, get, just getting better as a hobbyist, uh, would be attracted to your ad. And they would be repelled by all the other ads, because it's not a good fit. So we've just done the world's quickest matrix. <laughs> uh, so now I want to talk a little bit about the hero's journey, uh, because I put the slides in, and damn it, I'm going to use them. Uh, so as we go through this a little bit, I want you to think about how the hero's journey could apply to someone who is um, interested in learning some digital photography. So if the hero's journey is the basis of every epic story, it's kind of a formula or a template. Um, it was popularized by Joseph Campbell in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, it was, you know, there were some folks in Hollywood who read Campbell and said, this is, this is how we should make movies. This is how the story of, great, of a great movie should go. And they just basically, you know, George Lucas was the most uh, prominent to take the hero's journey and to map his Star Wars uh, two trilogies onto it um, to make it extremely satisfying. Um, and it's the psychological basis of human life, according to Joseph Campbell, that this is how human beings were meant to grow, develop, go through life, face challenges, and there's something very organic about it, so that when we see it presented in a, uh, a fictional way, we resonate with it right away. It's just, it's just something magical. And all of us believe deep down, and some of us it's, it's tragically deep, but uh, it's still there, that we're the hero. And we are, so that the hero's journey is not us being a minor character in someone else's hero's journey. You know, we're the hero of our own story. And that has a lot of implications about um, the kind of the, the way we see our lives and the challenges in our lives. And that's why all these formula movies and books and comic books and so on are so popular, because it's something hardwired into us. So uh, let's talk about some examples. And the source I'm going to use here is a wonderful book uh, called The Writer's Journey by Christopher Vogler, who popularized this and became a Hollywood script consultant and um, you really bridged the gap from the early pioneers of Hollywood who used this to uh, it being a very, very common motif. So we're interested in the start of the hero's journey, and you'll see why, as, you know, as search advertisers, you'll see why in, in just a little bit. So here is the um, trajectory. The hero's journey starts with the ordinary world. So once upon a time, there was the youngest princess. Or once upon a time, there was a boy who was orphan. And the ordinary world is where things start, but the ordinary world is not a great place. Um, it's often a barren land. There's something missing. There's something dead or unsettled or out of balance. And, you know, but, but it's okay. Things have been going on that way for some time. And most people are either apathetic or resigned. No one's, no one's making any great effort to change things. And this is the world in which our hero appears. So the ordinary world is the ordinary world with the hero embedded in it, in, some, in something of a dead-end situation. So if you think about the, the opening scene of a lot of movies, it will show someone before all the stuff happens. And it'll show their life, and it'll be sometimes it'll be a you know comedy, and it'll be sort of happy and light. But there's always you know there's something missing in them or in the environment or both. And very often, what's missing in them is mirrored in the environment, and vice versa. Then comes the call to adventure. 
something happens that rouses them from their complacency and says, you, you can enter a different world now. Something's, something's about to go down. And this is your quest. This is your mission. All right. And so what does our hero do at that point? They, they jump in with both feet and say, yes, almost never. Um, one of, one of the wonder, most delicious bits of dynamic tension in a story like this is when they refuse the call. And they say, no, no, I can't. That's not me. I can't do that. Um, I'm not that person. And the, the chains of their past experience and their limiting beliefs keep them from taking that leap. The next thing that has to happen in the hero's journey is the meeting with the mentor, the older, wiser, more experienced person who has gone through what they're about to go through and typically gives them a gift and tells them their true name. And it's the meeting with the mentor that almost always pushes the person into the adventure, except in such cases where they're thrust into the adventure without unwillingly. When there's a choice, it's often the meeting with the mentor that sends them into the, the, the other world. And then the next part is crossing the threshold, where they do something or say something or go somewhere that all of a sudden there's no turning back. The die is cast. So let's take a look at uh, some examples from popular culture. So Star Wars, as an example. In the ordinary world, and by the way, this is Star Wars 4, the first one, the real one. In the ordinary world, Luke is a bored farm boy living on his aunt and uncle's farm, orphaned. Very often, we, the heroes of these stories are orphaned, either literally or metaphorically. And, you know, he's really good at uh, shooting womp rats and doing this. His, he's resigned to a life of, of boredom and mediocrity. That's how he sees his situation. The call to adventure is his, when his new droid all of a sudden starts malfunctioning and playing this holographic message from Princess Leia saying, help us, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're our only hope. And Luke looks at her and thinks, wow, I could, there's a damsel in distress. I could save her. And he starts getting some grand ideas and then realizes who he is, a farm boy on a far-off planet, and he refuses the call, and he returns to his farm. Uh, however, it turns out that he gets a little help from the Empire because the farm is blown up, and his aunt and uncle are dead, and he can't go back. And that's the point at which he has his meeting with Obi-Wan Kenobi, the meeting with the mentor, and he gets his dad's lightsaber, and he is given his true name, which is to say, Luke, you are a Jedi. Your father was a Jedi. So he doesn't get the whole truth, but he gets enough to completely reconceptualize everything about his past, everything that he's known and thought he's known about who he is. So he has, literally has a new identity here. And in crossing the threshold, he leaves his home planet and goes to, um, to join the revolution. Example, Harry Potter. The ordinary world, he's an orphan in a foster home, treated very badly by his aunt and uncle, bullied by his cousin. The call to adventure here is all the letters he gets from Hogwarts, the School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. They come in everywhere. They come in through the letterbox. They come in through the chimney, through the windows. Um, they, they appear in the, in the eggs that they crack for breakfast. And in this case, he's not so much refusing the call initially as um, his uncle hides all the letters from him and then they flee to a, to a lighthouse. But then when um, Hagrid arrives at the lighthouse, bangs down the door, and tells Harry who he is. Your parents were wizards, Harry. They weren't killed in a car crash. You're a wizard. His reaction is to refuse the call. You have it wrong. I'm not a wizard. I'm just a skinny little kid who gets bullied. And finally, the meeting with the mentor, in this case, the first meeting with the mentor, is learning the truth from Hagrid about his parents. And then crossing the threshold is choosing to go with him to Hogwarts and not continue uh, in, in the unpleasant, ordinary world that was his childhood. So we can map the hero's journey very closely onto search marketing. Because if you think about it, it's, the hero's journey is all about a quest. It's all about a search. It's about you know, <clears throat> finding the treasure with, within. 
um, although very often it starts out because they think they're trying to find the treasure without, they're, or they're trying to slay the dragon and bring back the, the, the treasure for the, for the civilization, for the community. And it's a quest, and it's a search. And so when you, someone goes to Google and looks for something, uh, they're really on a hero's journey. Because all of us are on a hero's journey, and most of us feel that at some point along the way, we stalled. So if you think about how optimistic and excited kids are when they're little, in childhood, when they think, what are we going to be when I grow up? You know, I didn't go, I'm going to be a marketing consultant for uh, a new kind of medium that hasn't been invented yet. You know, I was, I was going to be, you know, left fielder for the New York Yankees. I was going to, uh, you know, write musical theater. I was going to be a lawyer and going to save the earth from polluters. I had, I had very grandiose ideas about who I was going to be and the contributions I was going to make and how people were going to look at me and how heroic I would be. And somewhere along the way, that begins to erode for most of us. And we feel like we've, we've stepped off the path. Now, some of that is normal growing up. You know, there was no way I was going to be a star left fielder for the New York Yankees. Um, you know, I don't have that kind of physical skill. Um, and so, so, you know, it's, it, partly it's, it's about realism, but partly it's about not honoring the gifts within us and kind of settling. For a lot of people, there's that feeling of I'm settling. I'm just, I'm, I'm growing up, I'm maturing, and I'm not living as big as I thought I would. So that person is also on a trajectory. So they, they go on a search. And they're in the ordinary world. And the point is here, they don't know. You don't know when you're in the ordinary world that a quest is about to come before you, that the hero's journey that you have been putting off is beckoning. So even someone who wants to get better at photography, even though this is, this is a seemingly very trivial thing, I think if every, everything we do, everything we want to do is connected to one of these deep, epic longings. So let's take a look and see how that might work. So they're in the ordinary world, and they get a call to adventure. And in search marketing, this is the primary search trigger, meaning the thing that makes them want to do the search in the first place. So we're going to be doing avatar work in just a couple of minutes. But think about, for, why does someone all of a sudden want to get better at Is it, you know, what's, what is the dream behind that simple and mundane desire? Then they're going to refuse the call. They're going to go to this web page. They're going to go and look here, and they're going to say, you know, digital photography course. And they're going to look, and they're going to go, yeah, no, I'm, no, I'm not, I'm not going to be a photographer. What am I, uh, Annie Leibovitz? I'm not going to spend 10 months and tens of thousands of dollars to, you know, this is a, even though I always loved photography, I mean, it'd be really cool if I was a professional photographer. That'd be awesome. I could go, like, do National Geographic shoots and, and, and famous people and, and do artsy stuff and, and, you know, post really amazing things on Facebook that change the world and go viral. Eh, but nah, I'm not, I'm not into it that much. I, I'm not going to take one of these courses. And they refuse the call. And there's a lot of reasons that people refuse the call. One of the most common ones we just saw here, there's nothing that's speaking to them. Another is that maybe someone is speaking to them, but they have all sorts of objections. And there's all sorts of ways in which the habitual patterning of saying no to the call, of refusing the call, does it one more time, and it becomes just another sort of nail in the coffin of the journey of their soul that, that wants to be taken. And they just, you know, they're just slowly, slowly saying no to more and more things that some part of them really wants to do. So at this point, they then have their meeting with the mentor, and that's the secondary search trigger, and that's the ad, and that's your ad. And the goal of your ad is to get them to click to your landing page because they feel like they've met the mentor who is going to inspire them 
just like Obi-Wan Kenobi inspired Luke, just like Hagrid inspired Harry, uh, just like Gandalf inspired Bilbo Baggins. All of these different journeys to somebody who's, who's both uh, mother and father, who is both nurturing and kind of a little judgmental, pushing them out of the nest. And if, if you can nail that meeting with the mentor and they come and they see you as this is the person who can help me with this thing, what they're actually doing is changing a, a pattern of saying no to the life that they could lead. And they're starting to say yes. And even though it's a little yes, you can see how a cascading effect can occur. If suddenly, all of a sudden, if they've never done anything artistic, right, they, did, they didn't, they played, a, you know, a musical instrument in third grade through fifth grade, but it was kind of loud and nobody really liked it and they didn't really practice very much and their teacher was kind of a jerk and they'd never thought of themselves as musical. They weren't that good at art and they've just never lived an artistic life. They've never lived a creative life. They've always been a consumer. And now for the first time, that person want, has an urge that they're going to follow through on to make art, to make pictures. And I say that's a big deal. And then crossing the threshold becomes opting in or buying or whatever it is on your site that takes them into this new world where all of a sudden they're getting emails, they're getting excited, and you've changed their self-definition. You've turned them from someone who can't into someone who can or who someone will, so will soon be able to. Uh, so before I go on, um, I just want to pause and get any of your any reflections you have on how this might relate or might not relate, in your opinion, to uh, to what you're selling and the market you want to serve. Um, yeah, I think it really relates. Um, I think particularly that meaning with mentor, thinking thinking of that as the ad will make me write my ads more like I'm talking to them more directly, okay. rather than just like a marketing exercise. Wonderful. So let's, uh, let's go do it. So here's an example um, for a keyword, get out of debt. So in the ordinary world, the, uh, they feel like they're, they're a victim. They're struggling. They're in debt. And, you know, it's, it's, it's taken a while to get them to this point. It wasn't like they're suddenly in debt. They've been in debt for a while. But maybe the call to adventure is that they're at the supermarket buying food for their family, and the cashier says, I'm sorry, your, your card is... and the shame, they just run home and do a search on get out of debt. So finally, there was an, an enough to it. Then they look around, they re read a couple of web pages, they click some ads, and they go, nah, I can't do anything about this. Then they're meeting with the mentor. They finally find a landing page that they trust, that resonates with them, that speaks to them, that says, yes, you can do this. And they fill out the form and get started. So at this point, let's quickly create your ideal customer avatar. And by avatar, if anyone has seen the movie, it's a, uh, in, in the movie, the humans get into a pod and take on the, the body and persona and perception of the sexy, tall, blue people from the, uh, from the planet that they're interested in. And they're doing it, the humans are doing it because they want mineral rights on this planet and they use this avatar technology to kind of infiltrate and to figure out how these, this alien uh, race thinks and so they can negotiate better. And it, instead what happens, the hero who becomes the, uh, this Navi, this big blue sexy guy avatar, um, ends up falling in love with them by, the, by virtue of identifying so closely and having such a deep perceptual link. He ends up appreciating them wanting to help them, wanting to serve them, and then when uh, things come to a head and the humans and the Navi are in conflict, he chooses this group with whom he has developed such exquisite empathy. So that's what we're going to do uh, right now, Ken. So let us uh, create an avatar for you. So start, let's start by you, uh, Ken, just sort of noticing your body in the chair where you're sitting. Uh, I assume you're sitting? Yes. <laughs> okay. So notice how your weight is distributed. 
Uh, are you relaxed in the chair or sort of tense and up? Are your feet on the ground? He's sharing equal weight. Pay attention to your breathing, shallow or deep, slow or fast, mouth or nose. Notice as you start to bring awareness whether anything wants to shift. You want to get more comfortable. Notice your relationship to your computer right now. Are you leaning forward or slumping back or kind of neutral? Uh, what's the tonus of your muscles? What's your general mood and state right now? Is it anxious, nervous, excited, relaxed, worried, low, high, tired, uh, jazzed? And the, it's important to do this because this is the noise that we're going to filter out when you become your avatar. So whatever you are, we don't want to project it onto the avatar uh, without knowing that we're doing so. So now, uh, I want you to imagine the person in front of their computer just as they're about to type in the keyword phrase, uh, learn digital or digital photography course. And first of all, t tell, me, tell me that person's name. Um, Diane. Diane. OK. So Diane is a woman, I'm assuming. Yes. And in what year was Diane born? Oh, um, I'd say she was born in, in the 60s. OK. Which 60s? Uh, I'd say uh, mid sixties. Okay, so give me a year. Okay, so let's say sixty four. Nineteen sixty four. Okay, and the reason I push you on this is that the goal here is to make this real. So as if we were recreating the backstory of a character in a novel or casting a character in a screenplay into a movie. So we want specificity. And the reason you're hesitant to give specificity is probably because you're a rational thinking person and you don't actually know. And you're making this up. But we want, we want you to dive into it and really make it up as if it was the absolute truth. So you can say with certainty, she was born in 1964. In fact, uh, you, you even know, you don't have to tell me, but you know her, uh, her astrological sign. So you know what month she was born. Um, so Diane is um, 48 years old. Yeah. Okay. And so is she? Uh, where does she live? Uh, Nebraska. <laughs> no, I'll just be making this up. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> but but as soon as you say as soon as you say it, it becomes real. She lives okay. in Nebraska. Where in a in a, uh, in a city or in, in a rural suburb. area? In a suburb. suburb. OK, a suburb of Lincoln. Uh, sounds good. Yeah, so that's one of the things we're going to do. We're going to help each other out. So whenever one of us says something, the other one just agrees and takes it from there. So they're a suburb of, of Lincoln, Nebraska. And tell me about um, is what's her, her marital or relationship or family status. OK, she's married. She has three kids. And she's, she, um, well, let's doesn't have a lot of time, you know, juggling the three kids, but wants to do something creative with her life. Okay, so she doesn't have a lot of time. To sh um, how old are the kids? Uh, they eight to sixteen. Eight to sixteen, you said. Mm-hmm. Okay, so how old's the middle one? Uh, the middle one is ten. Ten. So eight, ten and 16. So that first one must have been a handful. It took her six years to have a second job. Is it, is it all, is it, uh, has she been married to one man? The, uh... Yes. OK. And what's her husband's name? Bob. Husband is Bob. Um, so what, you said Diane doesn't have a lot of time. Does she, does she have a job? Does she work? Uh, she has a part-time job that just mostly deals with the kids. Okay. What, is she, what does she do part-time? Uh, receptionist. Okay. Uh, at a dental office? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thought so. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so she she'll work from like you know like nine to nine to two, yes, Monday through then... Thursday, uh, which gives her time to take the kids to school and pick them up, and then once they're home, she's got to she's got to run them around. What like what sort of things do, does she have to do with them? Um, take them to uh, gymnastics and tennis, and take them to all the sporting events. And then get them all back and start getting dinner ready. Right, it's, it's exhausting. You know, I'm I'm only 47, but I could feel what it's going to be like in a year. <laughs> okay, and um, what does she like to do? If she's, uh, what's her hobby? If if you had the time. Okay, she reads a bit, but she wants to start taking photos. And she's on she's on Facebook, catching up with all her old school friends and neighborhood friends. Okay, cool. So, and here here the hobby question falls directly into what we're interested in um, as merchants. Mm -hmm. So tell us, let's talk a little bit. Let's let's make her a hero and put her into the hero's journey a little bit. Tell me what she was like as a child. What what got her excited? What got her excited as a child? Um, she liked going. She liked going on holidays to like beach resorts and and the mountains. She, she had an appreciation about nature and beautiful things from a young age. Hmm. Nature, beach, and mountains. And of course, she lives in the middle of the flattest part of the entire country. <laughs> yeah. So she kind of she kind of misses those those natural elements. She appreciates where she's at, but still, uh, she has a little bit of wanderlust, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. Can you can you feel um, sort of how ironic is it, it is for her to be in Nebraska when yeah. when when part of her when, now did she ever get to go traveling when she was younger before she got married? And had yeah, with her dad. So her dad took her places. She went places with her dad. And what was he like? What was her relationship with him like? Uh, she had a good relationship with him. Um, it says uh, they had a, they, her parents split up when they were young, so she'd go with her dad, and he'd mostly take them on holidays. Hmm. So he, 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 could, he could be the fun dad. Yeah. And so they'd go, and they'd go places. Yes. Did he, ha did he have um, money, or was it sort of like, you know, Local trips or, or motorhome or were they like flying to Paris? Uh, mostly road trips, kind of middle income. Uh huh. And what did she like especially about these road trips? Um. Well, more the actual destination where they get to spend time and in, in like on the beach and um, just just spending time in those places that are. Nothing like where she's brought up. Mm, so it's a kind of a, a, a novelty and a magic and a glamour uh, and a glamour yeah. to it. Okay. So when she was young, what did she think she was going to be when she grew up? What was her big dream? Ah, um, maybe she thought of becoming a scientist and save the forest kind of thing. Okay, uh, that's fine except for the word maybe. <laughs> okay. So she, wa she wanted to be a scientist. Um, okay. what, uh, what did she want to save? And you know, here, here I'd like to offer anyone who's listening, if you have questions, I don't have to be the only one asking the question. In fact, the more variety of input we get, the better this goes. So anyone else has a question, uh, for Diane. And at this point, um, I would like uh, Ken to go away and to invite Diane to answer the questions. Okay, so Diane, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So who has, who's got questions for Diane? Just type them and, uh, and Diane can, can speak for herself. So you, you, you wanted to be a scientist. So who, who were your, did you have like science uh, idols or people you looked up to that you, you know, read about in school or your parents told you about that were like role models for who you wanted to be? Uh, I saw some shows with some scientists like Carl Sagan and, and 
David Attenborough, who used to do these cool shows about animals, and uh, so I thought I could save the whales and save some of these rare species from going extinct. Gotcha. So it's really a bit about animals and 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 you know, weak, glamorous places. So that you know, the, if you thought you know the beach and the mountains were glamorous from your experience, there were there were things like rainforests in Borneo, and and giant volcanoes and and undersea creatures. And you kind of wanted to to learn about them and then and then save them from extinction. And maybe the desire just to see them, like in their natural habitats. To see them. To so see maybe them. not so much, maybe not from an intellectual perspective, probably not understanding what being a scientist is all about, mm. just just the idea of somehow helping them. Ah, I, I see that. So it's a, so it, re it really is sort of a uh, like a kinship with, yeah. with with these with these creatures that you've only seen on TV or seen in books. And and wanting to feel, feeling your soul's calling to to somehow connect with them. Yeah. To know that there's there's a richness there for you. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your first name, whether it's uh, Jutta or Hutta. Uh, wants to know what did you want to save, the forest, or did you want to be David Suzuki? So I don't know who David Suzuki is. I'm sure, if you could get that reference. Okay. Well. Well, the ideas were when I was really young, so it was more like, more like the romantic notion of just somehow helping creatures in these environments and preserving those forests so they can live there. Probably not sort of really understanding what the scientists will actually would actually do in those situations, but just more the romantic notion of somehow making a difference. Gotcha. And, and visiting them, you know, visiting these places. Mm -hmm. So the so I'm I'm getting an archetype here, and for a while I thought the archetype was going to be the adventurer, you know, the the, the, the traveler on the journey, but I feel I'm feeling like I'm getting something very different. This is this is more like the mystic. This is someone who wants to go and, and you know and um, skip through meadows with unicorns, <laughs> and um, you know and and laugh with bears. Um, and have and have and felt had a real felt connection with the natural world. I felt was very was very important to her identity and to and to the the richness of her life. Yeah. So Ross is curious about what was your social circle like when you were a kid? Were you a popular kid? Were you kind of a loner? Were you sort of in the middle? How would you describe your your social life as a child? Kind of a loner, um, and that's why I really appreciated the trips with my dad to those places. Because mm. it's did, you you know, I didn't need friends in those situations. Mm. Did do you have brothers and sisters, or was it just you and your dad? I had an older sister. And did she she came with you? Yes. Okay. So and I find she, myself curious about what that dynamic was like? Did you two get along? Yes, when we were younger. Kind of hung out a lot, but um, she seemed less interested in the wild and the environments. Mm. So what, is she, what does she do now? She's just a homemaker. Okay. Does she live near you? Uh, no, different state. Okay. Uh, so, uh, do you think you were your dad's favorite? Uh, I think it, I was his quiet favorite. Uh huh. That he had he had something. That he tried to him. be neutral as possible. Right. Okay. But it sounds it sounds like you two had a connection uh, on a deeper level on these trips about the, the the magical places you were going. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, Yutta noticed something in, in your phraseology where you said, just a homemaker. And so you're sort of a homemaker with a part-time job. So it, it, it sounded like you were, uh, Diane, you were sort of a little bit um, minimizing that role. 
in your life? Do you feel like it's it's a noble, fulfilling thing, or do you feel a little bit like you could be doing more yourself? Kind of feeling missing out on something. So it's you know like there's potential that was never reached. I feel like I had potential that I just really haven't been able to explore. Yeah, I can, I can feel that. And even in the what's what's your relationship with your kids? Or do any of them have that that certain you know whatever you had and that you shared with your dad about creatures and travel and and, and glamour and a bigger world out there? Uh, kids are more they the older ones more into sports. I'd say the youngest may be more interested in that. Mm, the so eight-year-old eight has more interest in nature, but the older two seem to be more, more into an active world, like mm. sporting events. And the the eight-year-old is really really looks up to, um, I, I guess uh, we we haven't talked about what what their what their sexes are, but looks up to the older ones, and you you sense is is trying to suppress a little bit of that inner sensitivity to fit in, to be tough, to play the sports, to be to be scrappy, and that's kind of making you sad. Like another another generation in which this uh, this delicate uh, apprehension of nature is being sort of drowned out by the by the drum of suburbia. Yeah. Yeah. Su suppressed by the peers think are cool and what's, yeah. seen, what's, what's seen as, you know, cool behavior and what's nerdy and that whole thing. Yeah. Um, so, and, you know, as I'm hearing this, I hear something very, very delicate, very fluttery, like a butterfly's wing trying to survive, trying, you know, gasping for breath. In a in an environment that is very much more materialistically focused, much more about achievement and consumption and fitting in, and this, the eight-year-old is starting to lose it, and this is this is making you, even though you're not really aware of it until now, until we've really dived dived into it, that, that there's a there's a there's a poignancy and a sadness in you, Diane. Um, the, in, in it, uh, Yoda's phrase is, you gave up a life for motherhood. You find yourself in with lack of freedom and having sort of given up on this dream, even though now you look back and say, well, it was a very unsophisticated dream. It was, I didn't know what science was. I just wanted to like hang out with creatures and see exotic places. Is there part, is there part of you that, um, if you're really honest with yourself, would love to like break free and go explore the world. Yes, yeah, definitely a element, a slight element of resentment. Not to the point where I'd acted out on the kids, but just mm -hmm. that sort of emptiness inside where you feel a bit unfulfilled. Okay. So can can you see how this maps onto? A hero's journey that's been stalled and the refusal of the call? Yes, like the call was abandoned, is that what you mean? Yeah, like some some at some point you said you didn't say yes to something that is actually extremely important and precious to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so y Yuta is, uh, is is urging you here to take the children with you. They are old enough. Go go for it. <laughs> but of course that's uh there's a lot of entanglements there. They're very happy in their life. Your husband is, is happy in his job, uh, his social circles. And so you're looking for some outlet. Um, so, you know, if, if you, you know, you may not climb Everest or dive down to the barrier reef or, uh, or see Ayers Rock, but you can still see the magic in the world around you, maybe through the lens of a camera. Mm -hmm. So what does this mean to you, that you're about to sit down and type the words digital photography course? What would it mean to you if 
you became an accomplished photographer at this point in your life. Well, that'd be fantastic. I feel that somehow it'll be an expression of my desires, at least being able to capture some amazing scenery and beauty in the world. So it's, it's, it'll be like an outlet for some of that creativity and, and desires I had. Mm. Uh, right, or you have to say, or the eyes of your children. See the, see the world through the lens of your camera, which is children's eyes. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an innocence and a, when you're looking through a camera lens, you're you're kind of seeing what is. You're not you're not imposing judgments and filters upon it. It's a much more, in a sense, even though you're looking through a bunch of lenses, it's actually a much more uh, focused, honest? honest look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, Ross says bringing her back travel, bringing her travels back to her home via photos, and Yuta uses the word innocence. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if, you were, if you were to write a diary entry, Diane, at this moment, you're about to do a search for a digital photography course and someone moves your hands away from the computer and puts a pen in your hand and a, and a notepad, or you know, a, a diary, and says, talk about what you want right now what you what feeling you want to get rid of and what feeling you want to have at the end of the search. So we're not going to go through the, the whole process of, of five minutes of, of dead air during a webinar. But what mm -hmm. sort of comes out for you? You say, Dear Diary, what I want more than anything else right now And what is that what would that mean to you? What feeling what 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 feeling state are you trying to move from and to? Feeling of accomplishment that I've achieved something. Yeah, I feel I feel stuck right now that I'm off my path, and I want to get good at this thing. But you know, this is very different from me speaking as as Howie as myself. I wanted to take pictures because I had an expensive piece of equipment that I didn't feel worthy of. Mm. This is not what she's up against at all. She's I, I want to feel connected. I want I want to see I want to see the world in a better way. It's just a, I want this mm -hmm. I want this lens to be a magical portal to the way that I was in the world when I was young and when I had these connections. Mm -hmm. When I felt kinship with animals. I felt when I was a kid I felt like the birds could understand me and I could understand them. And I never told that to anyone because even at a young age, I knew that people would think, you know, would be cute about it. But I, I felt that connection. And and sometimes I wonder if I'm crazy for for still having bits of that. And I feel like the camera is a way to capture and honor the part of the world that I still believe exists. Mm -hmm. To see the world in a better way, I feel like there's a there's an ad line in there. <laughs> Um, so, what we're what we're, what I'd like to do now is invite uh, you, uh, Ken, to come back and to thank Diane for for opening herself up uh, so so beautifully to to give us an insight into what's really alive for her, um, and then have everybody on the call right now write some ads, write some phrases, some lines. If someone types, if if uh, if Diane types in. Uh, digital photography course, what do you say to her specifically? So Yuta has another line, young at heart, images to keep forever. Uh, so I would, I would use things you know, like recapture the magic. Uh, the world through a camera is a magical place, again. Mm-hmm. So this is you know, this is very different from from this, right? Does anything here even remotely speak to Diane? No, not at all, and not just because she's not interested in being professional. 
but because there's no there's there's no heart in there. Uh, I have a so, question then. Yeah, go ahead. Would Diane even write digital photography course? She might do uh, that, I guess, thinking that that's how she's going to find what she wants. Well, she's very um, practical, isn't she? Mm -hmm. She's nothing if not practical. And so when she thinks about, well, if I want to learn photography, what do I need? I need a digital photography course. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't have any problem with that. I think you could certainly think of other keywords that she might type in. But don't forget that all, all this stuff that we've just excavated is far from the surface. Mm -hmm. Her friends don't know this about her. Her husband yeah. doesn't know this about her. She doesn't really know this about herself anymore. Yeah. And can you see how this is, if you, if you can be the right mentor to tell her, that she wants to have is real, mm -hmm. that she'll start to say yes to something that she's been saying no to for 40 years. Yeah. Uh, so other folks, is there any, any other phrases? Um, I feel like I'm, I, I can sense myself starting to slow down a little bit. Uh, <laughs> and, I've, and, and it's usually because I've, uh, you know, I, I need more input. So other, other things that you could think of um, that would speak to uh, to Diane and make her want to choose you to be her, her photography mentor. Uh, I would talk about some of the, you know, a couple of, of unusual images. Um, so I wouldn't talk about like sunsets and oceans because that sounds a little cliched, but is there an image that you could think of, you know, an amazing image uh, you know, the capture dawn over the harbor. No, that's ocean. Capture, uh, capture a brave weed in a parking lot. <laughs> you know where I'm going? Like, none, neither of those is very good. But yeah, some, something, but something that would something that would be a little poetic, that someone would say, wow, that's, that kind of speaks to my aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, oh, we got a bunch here. So uh, uh, Yuta has a, has a wonderful line that reassures Diane. And the first thing you told me about her is how busy she is, which I had forgotten. Yuta remembered and says, you can do this in a few hours a week. Yeah. So, you know, for a few hours a week, uh, see like a child again. Uh, Ross says something that would reconnect her to her family. Show your family the world that you see, the hidden world, the secret world that only you see. Share it through photos. That's, that's beautiful to, to, to use the photography not just for herself, but to bring others with her. Mm. Doesn't, she, does, she feels more connected. You know, that's, that's the one thing. The wonderful thing about a photograph is it's not just in your head anymore. Good mm. call. Um, Reconnect with your world, says Kay. So that idea, I'm hearing a lot about connection. That what, mm -hmm. she, that, that what she is missing is connection. And so what, the, what you have to be as the mentor is the web weaver. You have to show her how the skill that you're going to give her is all about reconnecting her with communities that she has lost touch with. She's a little bit lost touch. She's dried up a little bit in her suburban life, and she's definitely lost touch with the magical world of nature. And so, you know, your, to, to appeal to her, your course has to have elements of community in it. Mm -hmm. uh, bringing her home alive. Um, capture a ladybug. That's better than, uh, than my, <laughs> my weed in a field, weed in the parking lot. <laughs> See your life through your photos. So there's some, there's a, a really interesting way to look at it. Your, you know, see your life through your photos. I'm trying to vamp on that. Nothing's coming to me. Uh, but the the idea is that these become definitions. Uh, you know that when you take a photograph, a friend of mine is a, a songwriter wrote a song about the photographs 
in his life and how you know everybody's smiling in photographs that's that's how i remember life even though even though there was a lot of pain a lot of tears a lot of conflict i get to remember the smiles because that's when we took the pictures mm -hmm. she becomes the mentor uh, Ross, I don't quite understand that. If you could elaborate, I'd appreciate it. Experience your life through photos, says Yuta, and leave a legacy for your family, says Don. So these are these are wonderful. They're they're all they're talking about connection, about creativity, about unbottling the spirit. Um, and so the question is. Um, you know, are are these going to are these going to turn into great ads? So one one thing is, um, you know, is your business set up to follow through on this? So in other words, if you t if you tell the most wonderful stories in the ad, and then the rest of your site is extremely businesslike, there's going to be a disconnect. Mm. So that either speaks to backing off of this, or creating some part of your website and some part of your uh, of your business that appeals to this. So I don't know you, I don't know. Uh, how much of, of Diane has been channeled based on the kind of work you like to do with people? Mm. So, you know, so I'm curious whether if Diane was your student and this was her uh, her mental state and her aims, whether that would be a good fit for you. Yeah. Um, I guess I don't, I don't really talk about this stuff in the course, but the idea is to give the tools so that people can take it where they want to go. Right. And again, so, I'm, not, I'm, not t I'm not talking about the course itself, but you. Mm. Like, is this, is this the way that you like to think about photography? Or are you more sort of technical or, you know? I mean, how, I think, how are you responding to the, to the sort of poetic flights of fancy we're all going on about the, the, the wonders of photography? Um, I, I, my focus is, excuse the pun, on beautiful imageries and capturing some magical moments in the world. So in that sense, it's, I think there is a fit. Yeah. It's, and so and I guess I'm, I'm hearing that maybe that's a part of you that isn't fully present in your course? Uh, maybe not, yeah. I mean, I just, I'm, in, I'm excited about the photography, so I think that comes through. But um, I should right, actually... So, but if we, if we take a look... Ah, oh, there you are. That's me. <laughs> uh, so when I look at this, and I'll, I'll let other folks chime in too, well, I, I don't see, um, you know what I do? I see the picture of you, mm -hmm. your, your face, and the smile and the intensity of the one eye I can see, and the little beard thing going, uh -huh. um, does, does speak to uh, a kind of magic. The rest mm. of the site, to me, not quite so much. A um, bit well, you know what the the testimonials do. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know you have the word loving, and you know the top of the testimonial, I am in love, and then uh, Andy Rose is loving, and then straightforward, simple understanding, comfortable, made me happy. So you can see this is wonderful that. Yeah. Everybody, everybody except you sees who you are. <laughs> right? You're not hiding this from the people who take your course. Yeah. They, they, they're getting a lot of, of spiritual, uh, you know, but then when we, when we look at what you've got, with you know, taking photos without doing this, without doing this, improving your photos, taking better pictures, daunting. <laughs> mm, and yet bit. what people, you know, <laughs> yes, that, that's absolutely necessary. But it yeah. feels like there's there's a a part of yourself that is is the uh, is not you're not giving free reign mm. in the course. Um, that, that's all you know. That's all about the joy. And I, and I guess there's a video here, right? That, uh, yes. That I'm not going to click to play right now, but I'd be curious to see to what extent it um, it reveals you as this sort of magical mentor. Mm, mm. Uh, now I can't tell if in this photo if you have a ponytail. I do. <laughs> I thought you might. So you're a, you're a little bit of a hippie, eh? I think I look the part. 
you, you live in Portland. Um, you, were, you were born in Australia? I was born in Africa, and in then Africa. I went to Australia for most of my life, and then... Okay. So, uh, Zimbabwe? No, South Africa, actually. South Africa. Okay, what city? Durban. You're born in Durban. Okay. Yeah. I, don't know if you, uh, I, I lived in uh, the Drakensberg last year. Oh, okay. Yeah, Durban's very English. You know, it's, it's one of the more English yeah. parts of the country. Okay. Um, so, you know, South Africa... Australia. Australia. Probably. Now you're in Portland. I lived in Hawaii before that, and then Missoula, Montana. Now I'm in Portland. <laughs> okay. So, so you're 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 the wanderer. Yeah. You, I mean, you know, the. I, I haven't been to Australia, but I've seen pictures, and I know, uh, you know, Durban and Natal are, are uh, some of the most beautiful areas in the world, and uh, Hawaii certainly. Yeah, and Australia is some of the most beautiful beaches, actually. Yeah, Don, Don is very um, impressed with your thirteen thousand five hundred twenty-five likes. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, so there's a, there's a lot of personality. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you're taking full advantage of it with the site, but maybe it's fine. Maybe people also need that feeling of you know competence and that this is this is getting through. Yeah. Um, that's a wonderful photo of you. You know where the, where to me it looks like the camera. Even the camera on the left, next to the easy, easy DSLR sign, is like alive and looking at me. There's a sentience to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to show you one page that I. This is just a recent um, promotion I'm giving, but I, I'm I'm going to pay more attention to some of the photos that my customers are actually sending me. This is the my latest link, and I've started doing a series of videos where it's actually voices. It's recordings oh. of my customers talking about the course. So. Oh, awesome! And I just, yeah, so, I just so there, to see those pictures is. on there. Yeah, some magical pictures from Disneyland. Um, there's this one um, customer. You see all the Disneyland shots. So he's, he's a customer from the UK, and he took my course just before going over to Disneyland with his family, and was super happy because he got these magical photos that he brought back. Hmm. And. Uh... You know what um, what gets me about this is you've, you're actually creating community. Mm -hmm. So the, thing, the very thing that Diane wants, is, you know, you're starting to create. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just I'm just noticing uh, Yuta has to go. Um, so thanks for playing, um, Yuta. If you're interested in the course which starts next week, uh, look for an email about it. If not, uh, some other time. And thanks for your uh, Really wonderful and valuable uh, contributions. Uh, so yeah, so we so we can see you know this is a, a really good example of you know you were very tentative when you started this process. You were like, well, she was born in the mid '60s, and as you got more comfortable just making stuff up, it became more and more this avatar that you were born to serve. Mm -hmm. Like this is why you teach photography. For, the, for this woman's soul. Yeah. Um, and I'm guessing that a, a lot of your other customers are getting that from you. Mm hmm So this is this is wonderful because I was just thinking we were going to write some ads, but this to me this to me is a um, a kind of branding you as the mentor um, to to give people the magic back. So and mm -hmm. and you know what what uh, how wonderful that somebody goes to the magic kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> to, take, to take these pictures. Yeah. Uh, so, wow. Yeah. Um, I feel like I feel like it's a good stopping place for the uh, for the course. And I just want to want to say one thing, which is the most common objection I get about this, which is some you, you'd say, but I just made this up. This isn't real. Diane is not real. Um, and so I have a, a stock answer to that, which is, yes, that's true. Diane is not real. And three things. Number one, there is probably a lot of truth here, that there are people like this. And we saw on your own site that the people who uh, who have given you testimonials are responding in a very emotional way, that they've been filled up, that mm -hmm. they've been enabled. It's not just, I, I now have this facility with this expensive piece of machinery that I didn't have before.
Yeah. Number two, if you don't go for it, even if it's not true, writing ads for Diane means you're like you're swinging hard. You know, it's a, a baseball metaphor. You're you're trying to hit home runs as opposed to the mediocrity that we see in the rest of the search results page. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that, are, that are saying, trying to say everything to everyone and end up saying nothing to no one. Um, I did a call last night with um, Glenn and Sharon Livingston, two wonderful marketers, and when we went through this, Sharon mentioned something that I, I thought was beautiful. She said, the way to the universal is through the individual, through mm -hmm. the particular. That's the way to the universal. And number three, we get to test stuff with AdWords. It's a, uh, a testing medium. You can throw up 10 ads and see, you know, have two ads for Diane, two ads for, um, for Howie, who just wants to use his, uh, his, his machine better, two ads for Philippa, who, uh, who wants to become a professional someday, but, but wants to make sure that she is a good hobbyist before she spends the money on a big course. Mm -hmm. And so we just get to test it. Even if you're wrong, it's not like you're staking everything on this. Uh, so back to this idea of, that I started with of dominating your market. So you can see how the idea of domination, of coming in with uh, you know, overwhelming might and, and crushing your competition, makes it very hard to do this kind of work. And I feel like this is the kind of work that really differentiates, that gives you more of the right people clicking through, uh, a higher visitor value, more of the people who come to your site will now be predisposed to take you up on your offer. And so you're going to end up with a lower cost per lead, lower cost per sale, which means higher profits, which means more money to spend on clicks, which means more testing, more improvements, which becomes a virtuous cycle for you, a vicious cycle for your competitors. And that's why we have this uh, sports metaphor of checkmate, of victory. But we don't achieve checkmate here by directly trying to outmuscle our competitors. Instead, we do it by trying to outlove our prospects, to hear them and understand them and serve them in a way that nobody else knows how to do or is willing to do. And what will happen in a market when you do that first is the competition will get better, but in a different way than we think of. That, that the, the real way competition happens in nature, it's almost never sort of head to head. Um, instead, it's about niching. It's about you saying that I work with this type of person. And these are the 13,525 people who, or 15,000 who found me already. And that's because, because they resonate with who I am. And the more clearly I become that, the more of those people will resonate with me without confusion. And someone else will say, you know what, I'm the hardcore guy who's going to teach you every little stop on your camera, and you're going to use that thing like a pro. And that would be someone that would be, uh, you know, would attract a, a different audience. So we end, we end up by, uh, you know, raising up the whole market and allowing everyone to differentiate based on their personality and on their strengths and on their passions. Um, so, you know, if you can enter the mind of your market and figure out really what they want, the question is what, what would that do for you? And now I'm, uh, I'm gently um, shifting into the close for the course that I'm going to start teaching next week um, and pointing out that Checkmate is not just about ads. Here you see we kind of used it to back into a persona on your website to create a, um, a, t you know, a, uh, a vision of you as the mentor. And this little this fantasy exercise we did actually kind of connected pretty well with some of the imagery and the words and the initiatives you're already taking on the site. You can do this with landing page headlines. You might look at your, your, uh, the headline on that page and see if it, if it can be tweaked to, to speak more to the spirit, to the magic. Um, whether your landing page design is a little bit too corporate blue, uh, whether the things you could do to soften it and, uh, and be more... Um, you know, welcoming of right brainers. Can you, can you change your website copy? Or if you have a follow up email sequence, if you have other online marketing media, how you talk about photography to your 15,000 fans on Facebook. Everywhere there's competition, everywhere there's a place where your voice could get drowned out by others and theirs could get drowned out by you, how do you speak in a way that connects deeply with your ideal customer? 
So I just want to check in with you, uh, Ken, and see was this was this valuable to you? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So can you see how there's there's areas in which this process could help you improve um, and and be more focused in a lot of a lot of the marketing you're doing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and to be totally honest, I would I would take up your course in a couple of weeks' time, but I'm flying off to Australia with my daughter on an oh. adventure. <laughs> Wow. Well, that's that's. Uh, I can't think of a better reason. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll I was catch kind you. under the timing, but I I pre-booked that a while before. Uh, well, we'll catch you another time around. Yeah. Uh, but this, I think this is a lot to work on already. Um, yeah. So, so I just want to check in you know, with the other people who are who are on the call. Um, since the purpose of this uh, of this webinar series is to demonstrate value and make you want more of it. So I invite you to just ask yourself, could you get similar results with, with going through this process on a deep level for seven weeks, not just ads, but, but lots and lots of different elements? Um, this is, this is a, just a small fraction, a segment of what the full Camp Checkmate is. So let's talk for, about it for a couple of minutes in case people have, have questions. It starts next Tuesday, so a week from tonight, November 6th, and it runs for seven weeks. Um, and I call seven weeks that are going to totally transform your business. So the syllabus is the matrix, which we really didn't look at because we decided that um, everything was about the wrong offer for our for our avatar. Second week is the ideal customer avatar. And so not just Ken is going to create his Diane, but everyone is going to create uh, their avatar and work on it and get into small groups and discuss it and people are going to ask questions and, and bring it out and so by the end of that second week everyone is going to have a living breathing avatar that's going to make everything else uh, just fall into place when we compare the avatar to the matrix to see where the gaps are um, week three we're going to look at the hero's journey in much more depth uh, and and how the search trigger we really start the hero's journey the search trigger is that first call to adventure and then the second search trigger is the meeting with the mentor and how we can create landing pages that really take advantage of this idea of you have to be the mentor. Week four, we're going to look at existing fears, doubts, and objections. So if we went back to Diane and, and, and uh, asked her a lot more questions, we'd find out that there are certain things that she has doubts about. Can she do it? Will she have time to do it? Um, can, can an online course really provide her with what she needs? She, she kind of likes to be with people and wants a community. So all the, all the things that have happened in her past that she has spent money on and maybe it wasn't such a good idea um, will come up, will be projected onto you. So understanding what those fears, doubts, and objections are is very important. And then week five, we're going to see how to use testimonials to answer those objections. So you have some wonderful testimonials on the site, and I'm sure you have a lot more. And we can ask for testimonials and elicit them in a way that gets us um, really, really good copy that speaks to the objections. Because when I say, hey, here's a testimonial, it's, it's from someone who loves it, um, that's not where the prospect is right now. The prospect is in a state of there's some barrier. And so if we can get people who, have, who like our stuff to remember what it was like when they were at that barrier, uh, we can have very, very powerful testimonials that connect and don't just say, oh, this is fantastic. Uh, week six, you saw how many different ads we could write just for Diane, and also you're going to come up with other avatars. You're not just going to throw, you know, rest everything on one. So how do we create a testing plan using AdWords or using whatever medium that, uh, that is efficient, that doesn't overwhelm us with all these different things we can test? And the last... Uh, week of the course, the, we're going to do 80-20 checkmate. It's a method that distills the whole process down to about half an hour instead of maybe two hours uh, if you go through it the whole way. And it's great if you have clients that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't pay for you to spend hours and hours on their site. Or if you come up with another avatar and you don't want to do some quick testing, uh, it's a really useful uh, methodology. So the... Um, the course is available right now at campcheckmate.com. Go there, that'll redirect you to the sales page. Just a couple of things about how it's structured. Um, I use the flipped classroom model, which means you don't get lectures on live webinars. 
all material that you have to consume for information gathering is on your own time. So you can watch it again, you can skip fast forward through things, you can pause things. There's none of that frustration if I'm talking and I happen to be going too fast or too slow or something you don't understand and I don't, I'm not noticing all your questions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important to me that our time spent together is, is really focused on mastery. So for mastery, well, there's going to be some homework, and part of it will be practicing on uh, a sort of a, a, a case study business, and half of it will be after, after you've gotten some feedback that you've done things right or on the right direction in the case study, then you're going to implement in your own business. And the tumblers are what I'm calling the live webinars, which it's not going to be on this platform. It's going to be on another platform that allows for breakout sessions. And so we're, it's going to be highly interactive where people are not just going to be one person talking and everyone else typing, but talking to each other, talking to me in small groups, back in the large group, uh, really wrestling with this material, challenging each other, uh, brainstorming for each other. And that's, to me, what leads to mastery. It's not just listening to a course. It's actually, you know, Ken, if someone took your course and all they did was watch your videos and they never picked up the camera, I think we could both pretty much assume that they're not going to get a lot out of it. Yeah. Um, so just like this, I want folks who take the course to pick up the, the tools and practice with them. Um, so if you're not happy with the course for whatever reason, um, just to let me know and you get your money back. That's a very important policy that I've stood by um, ever since I've been try selling things to people I don't know over the internet. Because sometimes I'm wrong and sometimes I'm a little bit too effective in a close and people sign up for something and it's not really what they should be taking. So, you know, that's a risk I take and the only way to mitigate it for me is to, is to be really clear that if you decide that this is wrong for you, you get your money back. So your part of the bargain is you gotta show up, participate, be open to new ideas and be willing to share ideas with others, then it's game on. I'm going to skip through the testimonials here. It's been, uh, we've been on for almost two hours. Just get to the, uh, the details. Starting on November 1st, it will reach its full price of $997. However, right now, because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to fill everything in advance, um, we're going to do an early bird special of uh, three payments of $197. That's uh, three, three monthly payments. So a total of $591. Or if you want to pay in one lump sum, it goes down to $574. And that's good until November 1st. So that's today and tomorrow. And uh, there's no big bonus ebooks, PDFs, old MP3 sitting on my computer. I, I tried very hard to make this course as small as possible, not as large as possible. So to give you as little to have to watch and read, to just get the information, and then we work on it so that you're attaining mastery over a very, very focused skill set and not just sort of getting stuff all over the place. Um, so if you're in a competitive market where there's there's a little, uh, doubling your sales is worth more than $600 to you over whatever period you care to think about. If you're willing to give feedback and receive feedback um, and you're available on Tuesdays, the course is on Tuesday and it's both at 1 p.m. Eastern and 8 p.m. Eastern. So uh, it's you know this time or seven hours earlier. Um, and you're fascinated by human nature. So if you found this webinar boring, you will find Camp Checkmate excruciating. Um, and just two quick bonuses to talk about. And originally these were just bonuses to get people to sign up early. And after a while I realized, you know, I really want to give this to everyone. It doesn't feel right not to. So I have to add other bonuses for early sign up. One is crafting your unique selling proposition and doing it naturally, not just mm -hmm. somebody saying, you know, you need a unique selling proposition just like FedEx and Domino's have one, you need one. And then so we just try to struggle to heroically bolt one onto our business. And instead of that, after doing this for seven weeks, something will come up naturally. So already for, for you, Ken, there's probably a unique selling proposition about how you differ from everyone else teaching photography. Um, and it might be a combination of things. It might be the, the um, you know, the clarity of the information and the, the heart that you put into it and the, and the spirit. It might be some sort of combination. I, we couldn't do it now. It would, it would feel forced. But after seven weeks, it, it, uh, it comes up naturally, and that becomes a really, really powerful um, lodestone. 
a, a true north for your business. Everything that goes through that, and you know it works when you say it to people, and they go, oh, wow, that's great. I know someone who definitely should use you, or, oh, I want to find out more. That sounds like me. And the second module is, uh, we also talked about this tonight, visionary business improvement. Are there ways that your business is not yet serving Diane the way you could? And are there things you could do, not just about marketing, but about the inner reality of the business that could um, differentiate you even further? So if you sign up before November 1st, not only are you going to get the discount, a significant, almost $400 discount. You're also going to get three months of Checkmate support in a secret Facebook group and three coaching calls that are going to start in January after the course is over, one per month, January, February, March, um, to help you integrate anything. If, you, if you're a consultant and you have a new client and you want to do it with them or you've, uh, you've hit a rough spot and you just need some um, feedback from the group, Bring it to those, and we'll cover as many as we can. And um, for, if you sign up today, as in October 30th, um, I've got a completely new product in the works called the Seven Metaphor Tools. And I don't know what this product is going to end up looking like, if it'll be sort of a $27 product or a $397 product or something in between. Um, but I'm, I'm uh, planning on completing it by February 2013. If you sign up today, you get that. And the reason I do that is that there is a, there is a certain power and magic I've seen in uh, getting people to not procrastinate even a little while. So that's a little, a little thing to sweeten the pot. You have till tomorrow to get all those other bonuses. But for people who sign up today, this is an extra little thank you. And remember that there's no risk uh, except wasting some hours of your time. Um, if it's not for you at whatever stage, get your money back. And if you go to campcheckmate.com, you can read through it, get more information, and at the bottom, um, sign up. So um, I don't know if there's any questions about the course. Um, I'm open for that. It's getting kind of late, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm fading, so I don't think I'm going to be, uh, be sticking on. But if you want to email me, howie at askhowie.com, uh, if you're not sure if the course is for you, I'm happy to set up the time to chat for a little bit to see if we can figure out whether it's uh, it's right for you right now. So um, seeing, so uh, Ken just said, I changed my headline, create magic with, instead of conquer. So let's, go, let's take a look at that. Uh, so on this page? Yeah, just refresh. Conquer is kind of destructive. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, where, where is the? On the main headlight in the top. Oh, to create magic. To create magic with your camera rather than conquer conquer your camera, you know. Ah, okay. So, so that, that brings me to something I want to say um, I just as a caveat, and I usually don't talk about this until I'm in the middle of the course, is that I would, I would be happier if you did testing as opposed to just saying, hey, this is, this is definitely better. Now, in yeah. this case, you, you also have a strong intuition about it, and it feels like it, uh, it resonated with you. Yeah. So I don't think, you know, this, but in general, um, you want to be testing these things rather than saying, okay, now I know, I know what works, and it's not this. Yeah. So I just wanted, wanted to throw that out. That's a good point, um, yeah. So uh, Kay wants to know, how many people am I accepting for the course? Um, I am limited um, with, with my um, um, teleconference software to 75 people. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm only taking 72 for each course, for the, the 1 p.m. and the 8 p.m. You can go to either one, but most people don't. So I'm limiting it to 100 to make sure we always have enough room for everyone um, on the audio courses, which means you know, t typically it will be somewhere between six, you know, 50 to, to 60 people. Um, means if we get into groups of four, there'll be you know, 15, 10 to 15 to 20 groups of four, um, and then coming back to, a, to the large group. Um, and we're also, also the secret Facebook group is going to be a place where people can interact with each other um, very helpfully. Um, so uh, that's about it for me. Uh, we'll be, how will we be grouped? Um, there will be some, some randomness and some not. 
Um, I'm looking at, as, as one of the reasons I want people to sign up before, um, you know, before Thursday, so I have time to go through and figure out the best way to do this. It's very dynamic. Who, who would be? But basically, you'll be paired. You'll be grouped with different people each time, because I think that's the richest um, experience. You know, if 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 there's a group that's uh, that can't get along or something, you know, we'll 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 fix that. But I, you know, the type of people who who are attracted to my work and to this course, I've actually never had a problem. Um, with with people, you know, being ungenerous or uh, or heavy-handed or, or any of the things that makes groups not work so well. So, okay, thanks for those questions. If you have more, email me howie at askhowie.com. We'll get on the phone for a few minutes. I don't want to keep everybody else up and waiting. Um, Ken, thank you so much for for playing, for being so open and willing, and uh, and and just rolling up your sleeves and diving in. Just, just made this, uh, <laughs> You made this a very a very rich time for me, and so I, I hope it was uh, useful for you and uh, and good for everybody else. And uh, thank Diane for us when you get a chance when you next see her. <laughs> and thank you everybody. I'm gonna hang up and go to bed again. Uh, CampCheckmate.com. I'd love to see you uh, on the course. And that's about it. Uh, have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night.